Hi, hello, welcome to Chasm Reads. My name is Sam and I am so happy to see you today. Yesterday I posted my non-spoiler review for the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy by Tad Williams and today I'm doing my spoiler-filled discussion. This is going to be a lot more pointed, directed video than the, uh, I guess, I, I shouldn't say more. This video is going to be a lot less talking about what the books are about and more talking about specific things and characters within the books and my thoughts on them. So if you're curious about my thoughts on the series overall, definitely check out the review. I totally plan to do further videos about Memory and Sorrow and Thorn in the future. I would really like to compare them and some characters in them to other major fantasy series. I, I mentioned in my non-spoiler review that Jasso reminds me of Verity and I think it'd be really cool to do a video maybe comparing the two characters and talking about like tragic prince tropes. If you've never read this series, definitely check out the other review. I don't think it's a series you should be spoiled for because it's a lot of fun and really interesting to read, but at the same time, if you don't mind spoilers and you're curious about the things that really annoyed me or that I really loved, this is the video for you. I'm definitely going to go into depth about the things that I loved, hated, surprised me, all that. I've also never done a like spoiler discussion before so this is going to be kind of new so I'm not sure if this is how I'll structure them in the future but this is kind of how I'm thinking about structuring them now. Again if you're curious about what this trilogy is about go check out the other review but I just they're so big there's so much I could talk about. I had to limit myself because talking unendingly about this series is probably something I could do. But it's not something that I think would be interesting. So I will let you know what category I'm talking about as I go into it and I will timestamp out now and below if you really just want to see the things that like annoyed me or whatever. I will also be using the same notebook that I used in the last video which is from Mincing Mockingbird and isn't it so cute? So if you see me looking down or looking like like lifting my hat up or something I was probably looking at my notes. All right I'm gonna just start off with like the biggest category for this video. It's the biggest not necessarily because it affected me the most but because I have the most to say about it as compared to the other categories I wrote down. I think that when you're talking about like spoilers the most interesting part is like the things that disappointed you about a book and even though I gave this series four and a half stars there were a lot of things that disappointed me or made it hard for me. And notably there were some character decisions that just frustrated me so much, especially in book three. I felt like several character arcs were wasted. First of all, Guthwolf. I loved Guthwolf. I thought he was such an interesting character, especially book two. He is Elias's hand. He is, he's afraid of Elias, but he cares about Elias. He's torn in both ways and he hates Priorities and he wants what's best for Elias, but by the end of the book he's come to the conclusion that actually it'd be better to take the Irking Guard and go join Jos Joshua. And then even more surprising is when he attacks Pyrades so that Rachel can get away. Not even knowing who Rachel is really, he's just like, oh, I, like Pyrades is evil. She must, like she's attacking him. I can't let anything bad happen to her. And then he ends up blinded. Like that surprised me so much. And I was like, I cannot wait to see what happens to this character moving forward. I did really like in book three, the, relation, the relationship, I guess, between Guthwolf and Rachel. I liked that he had like done this good favor and now she was like feeding him. But that really went nowhere. There was no interaction between the two. I This didn't disappoint me so much as I just wish there could have been some more of an interaction. But why does it totally make sense why there wasn't? Because when Simon's like, oh yeah, I was the one who's feeding you and that's how Guthwolf frees, like why Guthwolf comes back for him and frees him from the wheel. Like I thought that was, I thought it was really funny that a lie saved Simon's life. I think that is hilarious. And I wonder if he'll ever actually know um, that Rachel is actually the one who is feeding Guthwolf. I think, like, he doesn't even know how much he, like, owes her. He literally owes her his life, which I thought that was a really neat story beat, right? I really did like that. And I had no problem with Guthwolf going crazy and wandering around the tunnels. I thought that was actually, actually very interesting as well. And the, and I really liked everything in the Guthwolf part. It wasn't the direction I thought it would go, but I really liked everything in the Guthwolf plotline until he dies because it just felt like, oh, he died for Simon? Like, that's it? Like, it felt like had he lived, there could have been more plot. 
And that's a good thing in a lot of cases, but it also felt like there could have been more plot because we had all this set up for Guthwolf and there was almost no payoff. And it was so frustrating and something incredibly similar happened to Megwin, which actually is a character that completely pissed me off. I loved Megwin in book one. I thought she was really unique and neat and the character arc that was being set up for her as taking over as the leader of her people I thought that was really great. I think even book two, she started to get a little annoying, but it, it makes sense. It's like, okay, she's just making decisions I don't like, but she herself is still a really interesting character. Book three, I am sticking by her, even though I'm like, you are making weird ass decisions. Like you're leading your people into the arms of Scully and the enemy. Like, okay, I don't agree with it, but again, this is interesting. I'm, I'm not gonna like argue. This feels in line with your character arc. And then, she thinks she's dead. And I was like, okay, let's see where this goes. I can kind of follow along. This makes like sense. This kind of works for your character. Okay, I get it. We're kind of at like another point in her arc. Aolair is there. That relationship is kind of moving forward. And then she actually dies. And I was like, what? So when she falls into the coma, that was when I started to go. Megwin's character wasn't doing anything, was it? That's when I began to realize she had all this buildup and she wasn't going anywhere. She stalled out. Her character beats really stopped mattering around the time in book two when she sends ALR away because that's when the shift happens from her being a character moving the plot forward to her just being another piece of the plot. It was so annoying to realize that. She, like Gothwolf, dies for Simon. Like she, she pushes Simon, you know, back into his body when he's like stuck in the between place while he's on the wheel. And that's it. That's what she was doing. That's like her role in book three was to die. Like Gothwolf, if her plot had continued, it definitely feels like there could have been plot there. Like it definitely is tragic in that sense and realistic and like, yes, people die with unfinished lives. It's what happens a lot of times. But she died for Simon. And I think, I think this pisses me off a lot more because she is a female character. And while there are a lot of female characters in this book, there are really only two point of view female characters and that's Megwin and Miriam Ellie. And Megwin dies for a man's plot to move forward. Two men's plot to move forward. Because when she dies, Aeolar is then like in charge of the Hernesteer, I guess? That's kind of unclear, but yeah, like more or less he is. <sighs> I just, it was so frustrating to realize that all her character was for, was to die on behalf of moving Simon's story forward. So frustrating on so many levels, honestly. Ugh. If this was a worse written book, I probably would have deducted more from my rating of it based on that. I don't think it was done. I don't think it was done in a poor way. Like it does make sense, especially because right after she dies for Simon, Guffwolf dies for Simon. I don't think it's like a, oh, the female character sacrificed herself. Like the strong female character sacrificed herself trope. Like it, it is, but it isn't. I don't think it is very that necessarily. And I think that trope also applies more to like characters like, okay, spoilers, but this is spoilers for other stuff. But if you don't want spoilers for like Voltron or Throne of Glass, like walk, walk away. But like this applies more for like characters like Allura and Voltron or Nemia and Throne of Glass. Like the token female character dies for the man's story. Like. I don't think Megwin was a token character. She wasn't a token character. She's not a token character. But she just, it was, ugh, it was just incredibly frustrating that this was how she died and why she died. And I felt so much like she was an incredibly wasted character. I hope that the new trilogy has a character that could maybe make up for it, but I don't even know what that would look like. So yeah, I'll forever be upset about Megwin, especially because I loved her character. And especially in book one, I was just like, Megwin, you are such a cool character. Like if I were a lot younger, I would have been probably devastated by her death. I think that 
I mean, this isn't a book for children. But teenagers could read it. Children could read it. I don't think children would enjoy it. It's too slow. I think teenagers, it depends on the teenager. But, like, I read books like this when I was a teenager, and if I had read it as a teenager, I would have been even more upset because she would have been... I mean, I love Miriam L, but Megwin was the character that I was like, yes, I love you, Megwin. You're awesome. You're so cool. And it, yeah, it's ugh, very annoying. Very annoying. Ugh. Some minor characters that I don't want to say felt wasted, but just felt like they were being set up for more and then ended up not going anywhere. There's Rachel. Like I said, I kind of wish there had been more of a goth wolf Rachel interaction. It makes sense that there wasn't though, so I'm not like saying, oh, it was a bad thing that there wasn't. I, I was personally disappointed that there was no Rachel Simon interaction before like the, I don't know if it's the epilogue or, yeah, I think it's like an epilogue or something it's called. Let me check. I have the books like literally right here. No, it's the final chapter. And it's in the afterward, but it's the final chapter where she finally interacts with him again. There was just so much buildup of her character missing Simon and feeling awful that he's dead. And then there was no real reunion scene. So there was no like release. There was no cathartic moment until the very end when there's already been so many releases. I think emotionally it would have impacted me a lot more to have her realize he was still alive before the final act. Or maybe she runs into him in the tunnel, maybe like right after he's like taking Gothwolf's clothes and she goes, oh, Gothwolf? And then she's like, wait, Simon? Like that would have felt so much better as an emotional beat in the story than what we get, which is like at the very end, she's like, wait, Simon? You're this mystical hero? Snowlock? I just, ugh. Wish we could have had a better emotional beat with her. Padrak. Um, he goes missing? <laughs> um, like, he's just not in the story. Like, for the middle part of book three, which felt really weird because the first part of the story, like, it anchors on him quite a bit, especially like Mary Mel's part anchors on Cadrec a lot. And he's there for a lot of book two. And he's just missing. And then when he comes back, he just is like the bearer of bad news, and then sacrifices his life. I did think the sacrifice was really great. I thought that was really in line with the character. And it was a decent closure to his character. But the fact that he's like missing for so long, and it doesn't seem like he was actually doing anything important. That was frustrating he felt like a character who had potential to at least be present in the plot in some other way. I think he kind of does fall into the same category as like Guth Wolf and Megwin, where he just kind of, it feels like he should, and in some ways does exist as his own character, but it's also very clear that he's just a character there to push other characters forward, you know? He's just a plot device rather than a character, especially towards the end of his story. Even though I am happy with how his story ended up and I do think he's a really tragic character. I don't know. It just, there could have been more with him. A little disappointing. Similarly, Sang Fugel, he's kind of set up like he's gonna be like a character, but his his character goes nowhere like what was going on with that does anyone know did anyone think saying fugal was gonna be like more important than he was he is like in the first book it's like okay like i kind of get your role but then he survives naglamund and travels with the prince and i was like kept expecting him to like do something other than just take care of towser and then when towser dies and he like has the horn and I was like, oh, something's gonna happen here. And then no, <laughs> like nothing happens. Like if, I don't know, saying Fugle just was a weird character because I was like, I really thought you were being set up for something, but you just, you weren't. I think there was a while where I thought he was gonna be the false messenger, which do I talk about the false messengers as like part of a, I don't know. I don't think I did. So let's talk about it now. I don't think I made a list of, list, a list, a list. I don't think I added it to my list of things I wanted to talk about, but I definitely want to talk about the false messenger aspect. And I think that was it really for, character. Oh, there's a couple other things, but let's talk about the false messengers first. Did I like the plot twist that the false messengers ended up being about the swords and like the swords were actually evil? Yes and no. I loved that the swords were actually not helping our heroes. They were actually helping the Storm King. I thought that was really a brilliant way to do it. I think it was really strange that it was like the false messenger was like this. It was just kind of like a moment where I was like, oh, really? Okay. 
maybe it was just the fact that it's called like a messenger and you know tr it's kind of tricky it makes you think it's going to be a person but it no it wasn't even really a, a messenger it was like a message like be wary of false messages i guess false messenger really throws you off more so i did like the plot twist especially because the swords were evil the reveal definitely shocked me but i wasn't like whoa, I could have seen this coming because I don't know, you really can't based off a of false messenger. And I think the best plot twist you can kind of see coming or in hindsight, you could be like, I could have seen that coming if I was smarter. Some other small character things that really bothered me was <laughs> Miriam L just at the end being like, so anti wanting to rule. I get it. I get that, you know, she spends a lot of the book being like, wow, I wish I didn't have these responsibilities. She definitely takes after Drosso a bit in that regard. But... <sighs> I don't know it just she was so easy that she was willing to give up her throne to Simon which speaking of Simon okay fine totally saw it coming that he was gonna be king that makes so much sense considering the trajectory of his character the reveal of his parentage came far too late in the story for my liking I totally saw it coming from book one just because of the naming conventions but oh my god you reveal it at the very last moment Something like that I feel like should have been revealed earlier and we should have watched Simon deal with the revelation and the consequences. Like if he could have figured it out while he was wandering around the tunnels at the end of book three and then by the time he comes out he has to be like okay do I tell people or do I just keep it a secret and maybe he decides to keep it a secret and then like Isgrim and Arnauer and show up and they're like yeah we know you're like actually the heir to the throne so we're gonna make you king and then he has to deal with that too. Again it just felt very like there could have been a lot more emotional story beats in regard to Simon and his parentage and taking over and maybe we're gonna get story beats like that you know him having to deal with having been just a kitchen boy uh, maybe we'll see that in the new trilogy but yeah this this original trilogy should and I mean for the most part does stand up for itself but so, uh, the emotional story beats I think are just what was missing for a lot of the characters for me. World building wise I honestly wasn't disappointed by that much I made notes here, but there's nothing that actually seriously disappointed me in the way that like characters really disappointed me. I think my thoughts on world building are pretty well explained in the other video. I liked it. I thought it was really good. I thought the timeline was really messy and hard to keep track of. Like I said in the other review, I like two years have passed from the beginning of book one to like the siege of Naglamund. Like what? I did not realize the book is not super clear on that. Like I'm sure it mentions the dates but not in a way that actually stuck out and like was easy to remember or notice that time was passing. I think that is one of the greatest weaknesses of the book is just not knowing how much time is passing. It sort of makes sense because it is like this endless winter type situation going on. And in that regard, I think I play, it plays into it very nicely. But the moments when we're supposed to realize time has been passing, we just don't realize exactly how much was passing. And this bothered me so much on like, maybe it's just a personal level. Maybe I'm the only one. But I, when I was able to finish the series and look at a timeline, I was like, okay, thank God. Now I can actually tell you like when things happened. I think, and I do intend to reread these books at some point. When I do reread them, it'll be a lot nicer knowing like how much time has passed. I think that's gonna, you know, make the reading even better. Things that wowed me is what I titled this next section. Again, I talk a lot about this in like my non-spoiler review, but in more details, I loved the Sithi, I loved the Duero, I loved the Niskis, I loved the relationship of them, not just within their own cultures, but to each other. I really liked that the Sithi are not just like the good guys, like they have a negative history. They kept slaves, they forced the Duero and the Niskis and the other Tekedea, is that how you say it? The other Tekedea to be their servants basically. I didn't like that they did that. Like I thought that, that was an awful thing they did, but I liked that the Sithi who in some ways are the victim of the colonizers of humans are also not just like good people necessarily. I really liked the nuance and the levels that they gave. I also loved the Duaro. I liked that it came back in the like third act of book three. And I really look forward to seeing more of these types of characters in the new trilogy. I just thought they were really cool. It not only made the world building awesome, but it just, it, it led nuance to, the relationships of this world and nuance to the conversation about like who has the right to live where they live which again this book doesn't center on but is an aspect of the story. 
I also did really like the cultures and what we got to see of them. I loved when Simon got to spend time with the Sithi. I honestly wish he could have spent more time because I would have loved to just like explore that world a bit more. But my fingers are crossed a very particular character in the new trilogy is going to do some uh, time with the Sithi. These stand out 100% were the characters. Again, I hate that I keep referencing the non-spoiler review, but I cover a lot of ground in that review. So like I said, I do really recommend that. But I loved the characters. My favorite ending for any of the characters with Joshua, when he died, I was heartbroken. I was just like, I really wanted him to have a happy ending. And then he gets the happy ending that he wants. Like not just a good ending, he gets like his happy ending. He gets to go run away and be with his wife and children. And his friends all know about it. And it's just so good. I feel like we never see that kind of happy ending for the tragic prince type characters. They're either killed or they get like a decent ending, but it's not really the ending they want because they've realized they have a responsibility. Like Joshua gets to go be happy. He just, I, oh, it was such a highlight for me. We, I feel, like I said, I feel like you never see that and that we got that from a character that I care so much about. Oh, mwah, perfect, perfect. In general, I did. I liked every character where they ended up. Obviously, the ones that died broke my heart. Again, Guthwolf, Megwin. <sighs> you know my thoughts. But everyone else, I thought they ended up really well. I think that there is a lot more to be said about Aelair, but at the same time, I do like where he ended up. I think there's more that could be said about Jariki and Aditu and the Sithi characters, but again, I, I like where they ended up. I think everyone's story beats, besides the ones I've mentioned, really came to a really natural and good close. Some with tragedy, some with happiness, most with a mix of both. Really solid, really stuck the landing. Great job, Tad Williams. You made me not only care about these characters, but really you let me introduce them to my heart and my shelf, and I will never regret that. They are the heart and soul of these books and uh, they mean the world to me. Biggest shockers. So there were a lot of things that surprised me, like the swords being evil. Um, what else surprised me? Lots of things surprised me. Like lots of things surprised me, but I'm totally blanking and I should have written them down. The only one I wrote down is the biggest shocker of them all. And this one, I, I don't think I'll ever get over it. But the fact that Kamaris is alive, ooh, <laughs> my brain burst. I think I was home alone and I was like screaming at the book. I was like, are you kidding me? Kamaris is alive. He's right here the entire time. Oh my God. Absolute the biggest shocker. I, oh, like in like almost, I, oh, like I saw a lot of things coming, like the Simon's parentage kind of thing, him ending up with Mary Mel. Like a lot of those story beats, I saw them coming and they made sense because they're very fantasy heavy. I don't think there was any world where I could have seen it coming that Kamaris was still alive. And oh, it was so good. I still think about the reveal and I'm just like, this is amazing. One of my favorite reveals, one of the most shocking reveals in a book that I have read in a very long time. The Another Kamaris reveal that did shock me was Kamaris being Joshua's father. This one, I could have, I think, if I read between the lines, seen coming, but I'm glad that I didn't. I'm glad that it got to surprise me. I'm glad that there were still surprises in the book. But, oh, Kamaris being alive absolutely blew my mind. This is a weird category, maybe, but it's things that made me feel. And there's one moment in particular that I really wanted to talk about, and that is the moment when Miriam L uh, decides to have sex with the Spideys. And it's a sad scene for so many reasons. She's not sure if she wants to do it, but then she does it. And then when it's over and she asks herself why she isn't in love, why it doesn't feel like how she thought it would, it broke my heart. It felt so real world. It just impacted me on such a deep emotional level. And the book is definitely scattered around with moments that really do impact you on a deep emotional level and feel very real world. I think for a fantasy, this series really does kind of stray closer to literary fiction than other fantasies do. But the moment when she does that is probably the most emotional, or not when she does it, but her emo like her feelings afterwards and her grappling with it. That felt, it was such a powerful scene. And it's one of those scenes that is gonna like stick with me forever. Okay. <laughs> Did you guys like this spoiler discussion? Was it working for you? Do you like how I set it up?
please let me know down below. Like I said, I could probably talk about the series forever, but these were like the highlights, the things that I needed to talk about in depth and spoiler filled. So yeah, a lot of the discussion definitely in a non-spoiler way it can be had in my previous video, so go check that out. Otherwise, my battery's about to die. So goodbye, have a great afternoon. I'm so glad you got to visit with me today and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.